Pujun didn't we mock and look, um, Hamataki api. Gitipiko indigena kaz, Minawa, uh, Baganigijak wabamakwe indigo, um, Diana Senikla Jaganashi moening, Megizi and do dem, Misqua, Misqua gummiwe, Saga egening and dunjaba, the Kabikang and Danungum, um, Buju relatives, happy Native American Heritage Month to you guys. Give yourself a round of applause. This is a great turnout. So my name is Deanna Standing Cloud, and I greeted um, you all in my, in my language. Um, I'm from the Red Lake Nation of Anishinaabe people. Has anybody ever heard of that place? Woo, okay. That's awesome. Um, and I'm also a descendant of the Lakota Nation as well. Um, when my, my great-grandfather, Basil Standing Cloud, um, was in Red Lake, and they created the Red Lake Reservation borders while he was still there, and he was um, Lakota, so they let him um, stay there. So that's why I'm two different tribes. Um, I'm very humbled to be there, be here, and I apologize for being a couple minutes late. Um, I just rushed from um, the St. Croix Reservation in Danbury, Wisconsin. I have to share my my son with his dad. It's not very easy. Um, <clears throat> so we had a little weekend um, plan, and I had to uh, improvise because his, his uh, father-in-law passed away last night, so we had to like figure out a different plan. Um, as Native American people, we're always flexible and we're always improvising, so that's one of the, the reasons um, we're so awesome. Hey. <laughs> right, am I right? <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate you guys waiting. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm just, I was actually thinking about this presentation on my drive um, this morning, and I was passing the Minnesota border into the Wisconsin border, and I'm like, oh my God, this river is so beautiful. And I think once you learn, um, come back to your language and learn your culture, um, the world becomes alive. So I was looking around and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then my son's on his iPod, like, he's like, eh, what, mom? You know, and I'm trying to have like a moment with him. But, <laughs> but I was thinking about water and like my son, and that's what this is all about, is the future generations. Um, and when I got here today, they handed me some water, and I'm starting to be more co conscious of when I come in contact with water because it's such a beautiful gift from the Creator. So I think I want us to all kind of get into that, that thankful gratitude spirit because without water, we would not be here. So I'm so thankful. I don't even know who handed this to me. I think it was Wabin, but miigwech for the, for the nibe mini. <laughs> Um, but we have a special um, program for you. I don't want to um, take up too much of your time, but I will introduce um, our keynote speaker. And, and we have, um, I see we have a raffle. I'm not going to be a part of that. I omitted myself so you guys can win. Just kidding. Um, and there's going to be some Q&A, so think about some what you've always been scared to ask Indian people. I know there's a book, but you're going to talk to actual people. So if you have questions about Native people, don't be shy. Um, and I was also thinking about the month of November, and um, I think right when Halloween hits, that's when Native people start to tense up because it's like um, with the costumes, and then we have like Thanksgiving. Boo, just kidding. <laughs> and then we have the memorials of many massacres that took place. So I just want us to be kind of in that space where we're honoring the legacy of Native people and their survival also. Because water, wild rice, our spirit has kept us here to, to be able to speak with you today. So just keep that in mind and um, keep the, the, survival, the survival of our nations in mind as well. Um, my son said something amazing this weekend. He said like lots of things amazing. Um, he said, geez, Thanksgiving is 
that sucks. Every day is Thanksgiving for Native people. I'm like, yes, son. And he's nine. So I feel like I'm teaching him well because every morning when the sun comes up, we have our tobacco. And we're thank we open our eyes and we're thankful to the creator for another day. And that's our Thanksgiving. And we also thank, thank each other by, by food and gifts. So every day is Thanksgiving to us. So keep that in mind, too. I'm really schooling you guys up. You guys should be taking notes. I need to see some pens. Um, all right. I won't um, take up too much of your time. I know I could probably sit up here for days if I wanted to. Um, but I'd like to welcome um, the beautiful Anishinaabe Kwe, um, Ogichida Kwe, Doreen Day. Um, she is an incredible Anishinaabe leader. Um, and a woman. So when I when I think of her, I think of the power of the elements and the earth. Um, I know we've worked kind of in peripheral with each other, not directly, but this is a great a great treat to be able to introduce you today. Um, and she will um, speak more about the spirit of of water and the work that she does. So if you can give her a round of applause, that'd be great. Um, welcome, Doreen Day. Bujo Ninawe Magani Dug, Wabano Quain Dijinikas, Wabujeshi and Dudem, Abiting Aigua, Cape Medeo, and Schnabe Ojibwe Quain Dow, Minwa Ondadizi K Quain Dow, Gaye, Medewan Quain Dow, Asabi Kune, Sagai Ganing and Dunjaba. Um, so, my relatives, um, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, we know that today we're going to be talking about water. But we cannot accept, you know, we can't separate water from Anishinaabe Kwe. And Anishinaabe Kwe is the word that we call ourselves. We call ourselves the, this is the female side of life if you are born a woman. You, you own that female side of life. As well, our male relatives, they own the male side of life. And by, by saying, by when I say owing or owning, they, they really do own that work that they have been given by the Creator. And, um, and so for Anishinaabe Kwe, the work at hand is to look after the water. And so for the male relatives that we have, Anishinaabe and Nini, Anishinaabe and Niniwug, they look after the fire, two elements that we cannot live without. So today I'm going to be talking about the water, about creation, and, and how it is that we don't and can't necessarily um, untie ourselves from this creation. And in saying that, I'm going to be talking, um, just, just sharing with you the cusp of what our belief system is about our creation story. But before I begin, I want to say that the Anishinaabe people have always thought that all creation stories are true. And so we have a respect for others, for others, pe other people's creation stories as well. And so by saying that, um, we would hope that other people would have respect for ours. So as a, when I introduced myself, I said that I'm Daybreak Woman. I said that I'm from the Martin clan. I, I said that I'm a, um, a midwife. I said that I'm born to this beautiful, great Anishinaabe nation. And I said that I'm also a water line woman. And what that means is that, um, that I've taken a vow to pray for the water every day. And so this is um, what we'll be talking about today. Um, and I, w I was trying to decide when to do this, but I think we'll do it at the end. But we have um, a song that came to us in this time, and it's for the water. And so I think at the end, we'll, I'll share that with you. And I'll ask that you um, learn that. And I'll ask that you uh, add your voice to that as well. So as Anishinaabe, we are tied to creation, as I said. We are tied to creation since the beginning. 
And it's hard for us. Um, in fact, we do not wish to untie ourselves from creation. And so with that, I'll start by saying water is life. This is something that um, I want to share because it, there's not enough information that is known um, about our belief system. And it's not a religion. It's not a secret society. It's not some of the things that we have grown up to believe or what has been said about um, our way of being in the world. But the Medewan faith is, is that for Anishinaabeg. It's a philosophical, spiritual way to be in the world. It's our worldview. It's the way that we have been given since time uh, began that we have a certain relationship with the creator and with creation. And so it's not as, um, it used to be that we couldn't talk about this openly. It used to be that our, our, our elders before us who had to go underground with this beautiful way of life, that they couldn't talk about it, that they urged people to not talk about it because we were at that time in our history with the genocide and the things that were happening, we were not um, doing that out in the open because those that did were punished for that. Just for praying, just for using our tobacco, just for um, being together in a circle or in a lodge, we were punished for that. Some people were actually killed for that. I'm gonna start by talking about my mother, Misha Kibene Sikiban. She, um, she's been gone for 28 years, but her name was Charlotte Day. And her earliest memory about our beautiful lodge was when she was three years old. She was born in 1917. And she, they were out in the bush on our, on our reservation called Net Lake, or sometimes called Boys Fort. And her parents had taken her with them she sat amongst the fern skirt around the lodge, and then a sudden commotion broke out, and the long coats had rushed into the lodge with their big boots, and they destroyed all things sacred. They destroyed the drums. the pipes, all of the sacred items. So if you can think about that as a three-year-old, bearing witness to that. That was her first memory of what happened when you prayed in the way that the Creator gave you to pray. Fast forward it to me as, a, as an adolescent. And she told the chief of our lodge, I want all my children to be Medewin. I want my grandchildren to be Medewin. I want my great-grandchildren to be Medewin. Because they have the right, they have an inherent right to be who they are as an Anishinaabe. So this, this lodge of life, that's what it rep represents for me. It represents a lodge of, of love and of life. And without this lodge, I don't think I would be who I am today because I have learned about who I am. I have my identity. I have the way that our forefathers um, embraced life and this creation and how we are to be as Anishinaabe, that we are to carry love and light and to help others that we are to, to be mindful of creation and respect all living things, 
So these are the kinds of beliefs that, that you learn when you go to the Midday Lodge. And so why I speak about it today is not to do, do anything other but to educate you to the fact that it's a very beautiful place, that when you're there and you walk in that life, you walk in a sheltered place. You walk in a place where you are loved and you're respected and you're able to give that thanksgiving to the Creator and to all of, all of the things that provide us with life. So our Medewan faith is called the heart way. It's our way of being in the world. And um, being, being that we are on this female side of life, we cannot, be, um, we cannot be taken out of the notion that, uh, that we don't belong or that we don't offer something great, which is life itself, because we are life givers. So as Ondaji um, Kekwe, as a midwife, um, I have been given the sanction by our grandmothers of our lodge to, ta ta to talk and to tell about some of the aspects of our creation story. There in no way would, be, I, would I be able to tell you the whole thing, and, and I, I wouldn't, you know, I shouldn't. But I want to give you a framework in which to think about creation in, from our perspective and from the way that we have un come to understand it. So everything happened in the spirit world first before it could happen here in his physical life. And as we know through our creation story, there was nothingness, there was great darkness, there was, there was silence, there was no movement. There was no light, neither earth, sun, moon, water, nor life. Only the empty, silent cold. Out of nowhere, soft sounds in the center and all around. First heartbeat, first thought. From the center and in the center was the creator. A lot of times, you know, the greater society or the educational system, they don't think that we knew of science. They don't think that the Anishinaabeg understood uh, the development of the world. And, um, and our creation story says so otherwise. It's a beautiful story of how life began. And in this picture I'm giving you here, we're looking at the planets that came into being as a result of the Creator putting things into motion. And when he did, he sent his thoughts outward. And they went on forever. But when he asked her of himself, where shall life begin? That is when they began to go on a journey to find out. So as you can see, all of these planets offered a part of themselves as they created a large bundle. And so to me, this is Anishinaabe science, that we have had a relationship that we knew from the time beginning that uh, we knew of these planets and we had knowledge of these planets and what they, what they held. So it is the beginning, uh, before the beginning that we talk about as Anishinaabeg in our creation story. And this is a time when the great law of respect was, was laid out before anything was even created. When he asked her of himself, where shall life begin? They say there was a long silence and that it ensued for millions of years before she waited to answer. And while he was waiting, this is the foundation of that great law of respect that began there in the universe before the earth was new. Again, in our creation story, there were spirits that have always stood up for us. There are grandmother spirits that look after the water. Scientists, about four or five years ago, they discovered that when the earth was new, there was too much water. And that it, had to be, that it was at one time lifted so that the sacred seeds could take hold and burrow into the earth. And that time is known to Anishinaabe Kwe as the time that the grandmothers 
lifted the water and the earth was nudged. And who nudged the earth? That is the midwife story in our creation story. And so when she nudged the earth, then that water was, was assisted by the, by the grandmother spirits into a beautiful place where it is kept safely. So when we do the water ceremony, the, those are the grandmothers that we petition to. And we ask for their help to bring the sacred water to us in the here and now, in the ceremony that we are in. So the scientists, they don't know when it was lifted or where it was put. But the Anishinaabe Kwe, today we still have that knowledge. Today we know, we know who lifted it, we know where it's at. So at the time of the beginning, when the earth was being put together, there were no sacred four directions yet. So a lot of spirits of creation, they had a long, intensive meeting. And they say that it could have been for over a million years to decide who was going to hold our Mother Earth in balance. So after it was decided, they took their positions in these sacred cardinal directions, Wabanong, Shawanong, Ningabianong, Giwedanong. And it is there that they sit today. And one of our beautiful stories is how when Bibun, he journeys here from Gagike Bunike, the forever winter place, and he comes and brings the blanket of snow for our Mother Earth to rest. And then Ziguan, our forever sp spring maiden in the south direction. When springtime is to come where life can re be renewed upon Mother Earth, and then Ziguan comes with her warm winds. And they do, they, those spirits, they look upon each other. Bibun looks at her and she said, she's really beautiful. But Ziguan is a, a pure maiden. And she looks back at Bibun and she says, not today, my friend. <laughs> I have work to do. I have to work for creation for the creator. And so they never do have a relationship, but there's a dance that they do. And we can see that when the snow, when the snow comes in the spring after those warm winds come. And it wants us, you know, the warm winds want us to get outside. We want to work in our garden. We want to touch the earth. And that is Ziguan in the spirit of coming to with those warm winds. And then Bibun trying to get attention, brings that ice, brings that, ex, you know, that, that ice storm again, or brings more snow. And so that is true. Those are the, the, our spirits, our large spirits. They're not, if you can imagine, they're bigger than Mother Earth, they say. So, of course, they're going, going to be able to hold her in balance. On the other hand, when, um, when Fukushima happened, um, our elders in the Northwest tell us that, um, and science has proven that the Earth was knocked a millisecond off of her axis. Axle, axis, axle. And, um, and when that happened, um, it changed the way that she is sitting. So you can imagine Ningabian Nung, Ningabian, Mashkode Bijiki, those beautiful large spirits that, that hold her in place. You can imagine how hard they must have worked to maintain that balance for her. So according to our Anishinaabe creation story, these are the, the four directions that we know of, and, and other tribes have um, similar belief, but it may be that the directions are in a, a different color. For the north, for us, is white. For the east, it's yellow. For the south, it's red, and for the west, it's black. And these are all of the spiritual helpers that these large direction spirits need to help them. And I won't say who they are, but just to show you, I give you an idea. So since the beginning, these spirits of creation, they continued to hold our mother in balance. And, um, and we continue to pray that they are, are strong enough to continue their work, as well as our work, which is to pray for the water and to keep the fire.
Now we're going to get into Anishinaabe Kwe um, and, um, and creation, and we're going to see, I'm going to lay out some slides for you that are all pertaining to, to life and water. So this is the movement of the universe, as you know. And this is the universe on the left and the inside of a seed on the right. So inside of the seed, there's a new life waiting. All of the seeds of life are older than we are because everything was here on earth before the creator decided to make his children. When we learn and gain our understanding through our stories, looking back on our creation story, our knowledge, our worldview, we gain an understanding as to why we practice way, our ways differently. In our understanding, everything came into existence because the great creator put it all into motion. It was in this great event unfolding that we find our way of understanding how we came into being. We see the gifts that were given to us through these events and times, and we understand that our life here is our connection to the spirit and physical worlds. And this is the Star Nation Knowledge, um, and it's actually a book. It's actually a book about the cosmos from an Anishinaabe worldview perspective. So when we were created, after the earth was made, it was perfect. All of the streams ran, all of the rivers moved, all of the lakes, all of life was here, all of the animal life, those that fly, those that crawl, those that burrow into the earth, those that, that swim, everything was perfect. This creation was indeed perfect without man. In our creation story, we knew the four colors of man. And so this creation story says that Anishinaabe was the last to be lowered to the earth. And this is the, the point of reference that I have here is from the Mishumas book. And it talks about what this word means, but it also tells the story that the creator put four parts of earth together. And if he would have blown his breath it would have disintegrated. So he used a migas shell, a sacred shell to many people around the world. He blew his breath through that migas shell and was, an original man was given life, Anishinaabe, from whence to be lowered and the male of a species. This is the migas shell, life as we know it began long before the creator blew life into the Anishinaabe. So we know, we understand in humility that we, that we were an afterthought, that, we, that creation was perfect without us. We also know in our creation story that the four colors of man left the creator's side, but we know in our creation story that we were the last to leave the creator's side. So you can see here I have a, a Getty image <laughs> of, the, of the Migas, and it's, in a, it's a, an X-ray view of what the migas looks like inside and how it was able to buffer that breath of life. On your left is an indigenous shell basket. On your right is a water inner vortex. The power of breath, the power of water. Inside the mega shell, the spiral is the buffer to the creator's breath. And when we say breath, we also equate that with how we pray with our, using our sacred vibration of voice, anama, anama when. So to pray is to utilize our sacred breath. This is um, the, image of, the imagery of water. There's a water vortex on your left, there's a water spout, there's an underwater vortex, a wave vortex, a water vortex, and an underwater bubble ring, which looks like an Odis. With a, to us, that's our belly button. Nibe, water. Water is the source of all life. We cannot live without it. 
Water carries our history, healing energy, carries memory of everything that is. As Anishinaabe Kwe, our bodies are 80% water. We give birth and we have a responsibility to hold up our half of creation by praying and protecting the water. This is my daughter-in-law. She's from the little Grand, Grand Traverse Band of Odawa in Michigan. Water, the source of all life. Oh, and that's Lake Michigan behind her. We cannot leave out our, our recognition of the, our male side of creation. So as Anishinaabe and Nini, we're taught that fire is a gift from the creator. There's a physical fire, there's an internal flame, and there is the fire with no end. As such, everyone has within them the spark of life that contributes to the internal flame of life. Lighting the sweat lodge fire, the birthing fire, the funerary fire, are all examples of the physical manifestation of keeping the spirit flame burning. So when Anishinaabe and Nini lights a fire, we believe that that fire is a gift from the Gisus, Mishumas Gisus, the grandfather's son, and that it's the same fire, that is, it cannot be separated. So there's a petition and an offering made, and, and then the fire is lit in a sacred way. So we are tied to creation. Men's responsibility is to look after the sacred fire. These are both life-giving elements that we cannot live without. I couldn't wait to introduce Thunderbird Woman. Water is life. This is Thunderbird Woman. She is a spirit that looks after the water. We give offerings to petition her, to ask her to help us help the water. There is a reason that thousands of people are praying for the water at this time. There is a reason that thousands of people are walking for the water. So for us as Anishinaabe Kwe, we get our energy from Grandmother Moon. She moves the tides. She moves the water upon earth. In our rites of passage, all of these teachings about the female side of life are given to our young Oshkinikwe, or the women that, the young girl that is turning into a young woman that is given um, the teachings by her grandmothers, her aunts, and, or her older female relatives. So for her to go through a rite of passage, she had to study. She had to learn about her berry fast. She learned about birthing, that she had a sacred vessel that is able to bring life. She had to learn about healing, fasting, singing, braiding, weaving, all of the arts, all of our roles in helping with sustenance gathering, wild ricing, berry picking, maple sugaring, fishing, and she learned about this ceremony for the Grandmother Moon. In the Grandmother Moon ceremony, we, we have a fire, and we offer tobacco to her, and we thank her for the female side of life. We have never had a negative connotation for our menstrual cycle, and I hope we never will. This is Tur Turtle Island in water. In our creation story, we know that uh, we have been saved twice. We, uh, we had knowledge of the, when the ice came, we had knowledge of the great flood. And this is an indigenous um, picture or, or painting that shows that um, the turtle has hel had helped to bring a Mother Earth back to life on its back. Turtle Island in water, that's what I call it. Again, you're going to see this turtle reflected in the tree of life. And sacred seeds are reflected here as well. The tree of life to Anishinaabe is the tree that takes our prayers to the creator. The tree of life that has a vibration underground that communicates to younger trees and takes care of younger, younger trees. Um, they have a, an unseen and unheard um, movement and, and communication with one another. But this tree of life was special to Anishinaabe because every village had one the tallest tree. That tall tree was used to send prayers to the creator on behalf of all of the people of the tribe. From the youngest to the oldest, they would lay their tobacco.
No comes ni va Jesus, our grandmother moon. And she does truly guide the, the cycles of women on earth, and it's not just Anishinaabe Kwe, but other women. How many of you have experienced um, moving into a dorm with your, with your, uh, your co-students and all of a sudden you're on the same cycle, right? And, that's, and that happens in our families when, um, when my daughters will all be together in that, having a cycle together. It's a very powerful thing. So we share the cycle of life with her and her daughter, Mother Earth, and, um, and we understood that she had many gifts for us. In fact, the sweat lodge came from our grandmother, Moon. Now we're going to get into looking at, because I'm a midwife, <laughs> we're going to get to look at, um, you know, water is life in, in, the, in the truest way. So here we have um, our spirit journey to the physical world, Turtle Island, and inside of our physical mother, and the journey that the spirit, the low spirit takes to get here in, in nine incredible months time. So here's the sacred megas, and here's the womb. Sacred seeds and sacred shells. Here's a spiral journey and a spiral birth. Ah, the word seven, our sacred number of seven. We have seven grandfather teachings, we have seven prophecies. We have our seven hills in life. We have seven major clans. All of that, all of what was given to Anishinaabe comes in seven. And this is an artist, Leland Bell, from Eastern Ontario that um, created this painting of the seven grandfathers. Now we must talk about prophecies. In this prophecy, which is probably 450 years old, the prophet said, beware of the light-skinned race comes wearing the face of death. You must be careful because the face of brotherhood and the face of death look very much alike. If they come carrying a weapon, beware. If they come in suffering, they could fool you. Their hearts may be filled with greed for the riches of this land. If they are indeed your brothers, let them prove it. Do not accept them in total trust. You shall know that the face they wear, that if the face they wear is one of death, if the rivers run with poison and the fish become unfit to eat, you shall know them by these many things. So this 450-year-old prophecy that was given to the Anishinaabeg people, which I might add, we were 10 million strong before colonization. Now we have 880,000 left. So that's not very many Anishinaabe. Um, we, we have today in this country, we have 1.5 1, 1 million, I believe, is the number that we have of, of, total, of the total tribes that are left. So we think about where they are. They were in the museums of Europe and Canada and the United States. And we are just now on the end of repatriating those remains after many, many years since the American Indian Re Religious Freedom Act of 1978. Um, I think here there are still two. This is one of the stopping places. This is the great migration of the Anishinaabe people who left the Eastern seaboard before the boats landed and journeyed west on a long 500 plus year migration following what the prophets told them to do. When they landed in Bawating, I don't have a pointer, but it's kind of in, it's right there by number five, can you see it? Number five is Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. When they landed there, they were at least 200 years into their migration, if not more. The people began to doubt what the prophets had said. The, the people began to doubt if the prophets were coming, if any more were coming to give them direction. Because the people didn't move unless the prophets came to relay the prophecy. 
So the people were unrested about that. So the chiefs sent their greatest warriors to the east to go and see if this new people were here. And these warriors journeyed by canoe back to the eastern seaboard. They found where the colonies were and they snuck in ninja-like because they, they never got found out. They snuck in ninja-like and got a piece of red wool and they took it back to their people at Bawating. And when the chiefs seen that piece of red wool, they said, the warriors came into the, the council lodge and they said, they are here. And so that, that movement of our migration continued because of that fact that it was proven that the people that they were warned about were here. The seven stopping places of the Anishinaabe migration. So today's talk is Ngai Jitchige Nibe Onji. Ngai Jitchige Nibe Onji. And what that says in our language is that I will do it for the water. Because in this time, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice on whether we, we want to walk for the water or not, or whether we want to pray for the water or not. This is something that has an implication for all of us. So Grandmother Josephine Mandaman, who's in this picture holding the, the copper bucket, her Anishinaabe name is Bidasike, and she's a Wasisi in Dudamit. She's of the Bullhead clan. She began walking for the water quite a bit ago, um, back to 2003. And she did it based upon a modern day prophecy where an elder told her, one day if we do not stop our negligence, an ounce of water or a, a cup or a cup or, I'm not sure if it was a, I'm not sure if it's a bottle because we don't want to use water bottles. But <laughs> anyway, water was going to cost the same as an ounce of gold. And, um, and so she began a journey to pray for the water and to walk for the water. So I have her here because this is the phrase that she coined. So it's our responsibility, she says, our role, our duty to pass the knowledge and understanding of water to all people, not just Anishinaabe people, but people of all colors. And i um, so happy I'm here today to, to help her with that in this little way that I can. Um, and here on the picture on the right is a, a woman who is walking one of the water walks. You can see the asphalt behind, on, underneath her, underneath the copper vessel. Every, when the women embark on these journeys, every step is a prayer. And, um, and some mar remarkable things have happened. If we get a chance, I, I'll share some of that with you. So these are the Mother Earth water walks that began um, at, the, um, at the urging and the leadership of Josephine Mandaman Bidasage. So what can we do? I shared this picture because this was, on a, this was the artwork that was done for the Mother Earth Water Walk in 2010. And, um, and you can see the imagery. You can see Lake Michigan. You can see the, the shell. You can see that there's a, a eagle staff flag because Anishinaabe Kwe that walk for the water are considered Ogichidakwe or warrior woman. You can see that we're connected to the cosmos on the top. You can see that the buffalo stands with the women that walk. You can see that the water serpents underneath are watching. You can see that these spirits, uh, spirit women have water for hair. There's so much in this, in this painting. Um, it's very beautiful. It was done by a local artist by the name of Deborah. 
She's a, she's a Mexica artist. I have to think of her last name. Deborah Ramos. <clears throat> this I put in here because it's a, a very big um, initiative that started about seven years ago, and it's called the, the Great Lakes Commons. And it's um, really Canada and the U.S. have embarked on a, a, a relationship to protect the lakes. And so um, they're having comments along the Great Lakes to, to have meetings, to have um, initiatives, and to do, um, to do work to save the water. What can we do? We can sing, we can pray, we can walk for the water. Here um, are some, is some imagery here. Uh, this woman on the left with her daughter, that's Liv, Liz Jacola. She's a water walker and she works in uh, Fond du Lac Community College. Um, at the center on top there is me and my sisters um, singing for the water. Um, on the far right, that's me and my sister Bardo Lioso, who is from the Bad River Anishinaabe Nation in Wisconsin. Um, we were walking through um, Newport, Minnesota, right there by um, Cottage Grove. And then on the left is me walking those um, ribbony roads in the state of Mississippi. At the center is Autumn Peltier. She's a young activist. She's 12, and she's working for the water, praying for the water. This image is um, its just a reflection of the work that Anishinaabe Kwe has been able to carry into the future. We, um, we continue to put our hands to work in the environment, making wild rice, um, making canoes, making this beautiful work that you see down in the lower left, Anishinaabe Kwe is tapping for maple syrup. On the right, you see Anishinaabe mother with her baby in a Dikanagan. Um, we see a grandmother sitting on the ground with winnowed wild rice. All of, all of it, all of our work is, is beautiful. And here we have our med medicines, our sacred medicines, our flowers and seeds. Mashkiki. In this slide, we're looking at um, utilizing our spiritual knowledge to be well. So for our well-being, we're using the four directions and we're asking for help. And I don't know if you can, oh, you can see that good. I can't see it on this little. <laughs> so for our spirit, our heart, our mind, our body, these great directions, here are prayers for a good life. There are seven sacred directions. Father Sky is five, Mother Earth is six, and that indigo dot in the middle is us. We are the seventh sacred direction. I'm gonna take a minute to read these. Wabunung from the east is for our spirit. If we made an offering and asked for help with giving, prayer, meditation, cleansing, and hope, in the south, Shawanung, for our heart, we can ask for forgiveness, courage, self-esteem, love, happiness. For the west, Ningabinung, for our mind, for our awareness, our memory, our knowledge, our grieving and faith. And for the physical in the north, our self-care, health, exercise, rest and nutrition. So in a very basic way, we can fully take care of ourselves just by being um, cognizant of our outer world and what it affords us. Josephine says, walk the talk. In the wake of ex extreme extractive industries such as fracking, oil and coal, access to clean water is rapidly declining. In our prophecies, in our Three Fires Medewan Society, we are taught that water is very precious. 
I was told by a grand chief that 30 years from now, an ounce of water will cost as much as an ounce of gold if we continue with our negligence. If we discontinue our negligence, we can change things around. That's why I am really embodying the prophecy. You've heard it. Walk the talk. This is why I walk. On the left is um, the pristine Northwest, and that's after um, the tar stands, what it looks like now. And this is something that's a touchy subject, but to be true to ourselves, we know that there's a correlation, a direct correlation, between violence against Mother Earth and violence against Anishinaabe Kwe. And the center picture, this is a missing and murdered indigenous woman um, icon that is being used to bring awareness to, the, to what's happening to the Anishinaabe Kwe, not only in Canada, but in the US. In Canada, they have a number of women. They know at least they, they have a projection on how many women are missing. In the US, we don't know yet. We continue to educate and support women's knowledge and the important role water plays in both the traditional sense and the environmental sense, and how valuable their role is in protecting the water. We restore the roles through education, educating and through traditional knowledge. And this woman here um, is my hero. She says, think of how quickly we could heal this world if we, more of us were dancing singing, storytelling, and spending time in silence, especially if we were doing these things together in gatherings everywhere. There are thousands of Thunderbird women. Thunderbird woman is me, Thunderbird woman is you. Oh, and I didn't realize I did this again. <laughs> Mother Earth, the cosmos, the three sisters, sacred food, sustenance, gro sustenance grounding in our knowledge of the first gift of life. So we called her corn woman and she embodies earth, the moon and the cosmos. And miigwech, that's all I have for you. Miigwech. We are gonna take questions and answers, if I can, or your reflections, or um, if you have a Anything you might want to say, or if you have anything you may want to ask me. Don't be, don't be shy. <laughs> yes. <coughs> um, it sort of fell in my lap. No, um, no. <laughs> The idea. Well, there was, um, years ago, when I was graduating from high school, there was a woman that came to work here. Her husband is, his name is Jose Ibarro, and he was um, doing an internship at the University of Minnesota. And he's very, he, now well-known, prolific writer and educator and works at um, um, a college in New York. Now I can't remember the name of the college, but, um, his wife is Gaji Cook, and she is a, a Mohawk um, midwife. She came here in, with her husband, and she said, I'm going to be here for three and a half years, so I, and I'm not going to sit idle. I'm going to do something. So she went around in the community, and um, I was at the Red Schoolhouse at the time. I had graduated when I was 17, and I was still hanging out, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And so she approached me and some other women and said, would you like to be a midwife? And I said, without question, I said, yes. And she said, OK, you're in. So um, so she's a traditional midwife, 
and um, she's a lay midwife. So I studied with her for two and a half intensive years, and then I immediately, we hit the ground running and began to deliver babies here in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and I still do that today. Yes. Oh, okay. You. Okay, good question. Here's our philosophy on that. When we're in the spirit world, we are, um, we're up here. And when we're born, when we make our journey to become a human being, a lot takes place in the spirit world before we come here. And what has to come to fruition is we have to decide who our parents are going to be. And we, uh, we work with the creator on that and we determine who we're going to. Then the creator and a lot of things has to get put into motion, and we have to meet that person, and and then we, you know, we begin our journey when we are physically, when they have a physical sacred union, and we are able to be conceived. And so the philosophy with, for the Anishinaabeg is that we are making a journey for a long time before we actually physically get born. So we're in the spirit world, and when we come down to live in the physical world, we come down. And we are, we are lowered through birth, and we live on this physical plane for a, a, however long it's determined that until we meet our destiny and we have done the work that we were intended to come here for. And then we are called back home to the Creator, and we go back up to the spirit world. And so there's not, so when I say spiritual and physical worlds, that's what I'm talking about. We have an understanding that we all come from the spirit world, and we all return there. And so it was a long time ago when a child was born, a fire was lit because we were acknowledging the spirit coming here. And somehow through the travesty of being, um, I guess, uh, acclimated to society, we lost that fire. But we still have a funerary fire. So we acknowledge the spirit going back to the spirit world. But it was the same for us at one time where we acknowledged the spirit coming here. And um, so that fire was lit for, to go either way. So that's an important thing that I like to talk about because I, we are starting to get our birth fire back. And some people have never heard of it for so long that they, they're scared. They're like, what are you doing that for? Because they don't understand anymore that the journey here is arduous. Just like the journey back to the spirit world, it takes that spirit some time and certain things that they have to go through. And so we understand that we have that fire and that's important. Um, does that answer your question? So we go back to the spirit world, we go back to the, the star nation. Um, for example, when, when a baby is born, they're in a beautiful Dikanagan like you've seen in some of the pictures. And that Dikanagan keeps them safe but it also teaches them to be still, and it teaches them to look around at their environment. It teaches them language. It teaches them um, what they are to do in a physical sense. Like I asked my mother, how did I know the names of all the trees? And she said, well, you were leaning up one, against one when we were doing this or that, and you were, you, were, um, you were able to see the world, and you were able to learn that way. And so that lacing of the Dikanagan is like our DNA, because our story about our Dikanagan is that um, you're either at that time in science when um, the Y chromosome is split. In our story, it's you're either visited by a Nangu Anini or a Nangu Kwe. So you're either visited in the spirit form by the star man or star woman. And that is when you're given your gender. And so it's shown on the Dikanagan that this is star man and star woman and they interact like that. And um, that's how we are able to know who came to visit our child, if they are female or male. Yes? Could you speak some about ways of socializing and teaching boys and young men to be more respectful of women and of the earth and of each other and of themselves? Sure. What is missing from our, our young people today is that they have not gone through the rites of passage. 
And when a young man would go through the rite of passage, I'll use my grandson as an, as an example. My grandson is 12 and has had his change of voice. So he went on a fast. We took him up north and he fasted last month for two days and two nights. He built his own fasting lodge. He made his own offerings. He did all of the work for himself and he sat upon the ground and laid upon Mother Earth and he listened. And when he came out of his fast, he was very emotional and he said, I, I got to see and I said, see what? He said, Mother Earth spoke to me. Mother Earth told me. And so he had a spiritual experience. When they fast, they, that is where that maturity comes from, and that is where, because we are women, we know what that feels like to, to carry life within us. And our male relatives have to do that through their fast. They have to sit upon Mother Earth to know what the female side of life is. And so we're encouraging our communities to, to, re, to retrieve and reclaim the rites of passage so that that training and that teaching takes place that way. Yes. I think it did. I think media tried to do otherwise. But I think, um, you know, that the good message came out in the end. And, and by that I mean that so many people in other countries are also aware. Um, like you, I've showed you Thunderbird Woman. Her banner flies in every country of this, of this earth as a result of the knowledge that people had stood up. And it wasn't just Anishinaabe people. It, it wasn't just indigenous people, it was people of all faiths, all walks, all races of life that came together to stand for the water. And I think that it's important that we recognize that and we, we keep um, saluting that work because it isn't, we're all in this together. As Josephine said, it's our responsibility to make that awareness for everybody. Yes? How can we get involved in water walks? Oh, thank you for asking that. There's a, um, there's a website called Mother Earth Water Walks, and there's also on Facebook called Nibi Walks, and N-I-B-I -I Walks, and um, they just completed the Missouri River Water Walk and, um, just about a month ago, and there certainly will be more coming. Um, just to go back to those water walks, um, when I was walking, from, so the Fork Directions Water Walk was to bring the ocean water to the center, which on this Turtle Island, we considered the center as Lake Superior. So the water came from the Puget Sound, it came from Hudson's Bay, it came from Bangor, Maine, and it came from the Gulfport, Mississippi, where um, we started walking on April 20th because that was the day a year before that, the, that, that had that big huge oil spill. So when we took a copper vessel and we took that water, we made offerings and sang and we put our vessel in, into the ocean and we pulled the water up, you could still see the oil particles a year later. They were still very prevalent in the water that we carried. By the time we got to Lake Superior, keeping that water in the sacred vessel of copper, it was completely gone by the time we got to Lake Superior. So on that particular walk, um, we were by Watson, Mississippi, and there was a big land ridge that we couldn't see what was happening on, in the west. As we walked that day, it was maybe mid-afternoon, and it did get dark, and it, did drig it was drizzling, and as we walked, um, a Kiowa woman that was walking with my sister and I, her husband called her on her cell phone. He says, you need to get to shelter. And she goes, we, we're, we're fine. And he said, no, in Watson, there's a, there's a tornado. And of course, we couldn't see that because it, we were behind, you know, on the other side of this, this land ridge. So we offered, um, as we continued to walk, because we didn't want to stop, we continued to walk, and as we were walking, 
we um, had a, our, my pipe with us, and so we were able to smoke the pipe while the person was still walking. And, um, and then I took a turn to walk, and when I was walking, then we could see that the clouds were forming. And these clouds were ominous clouds, they were dark, um, they were moving. And as I walked, I was looking at the northern horizon, I was looking, and I seen a grandmother there in those clouds, and she was um, very large. She was, uh, she was her, her profile was looking to the east, and I could see her profile, I could see her hair, I could see her shawl, and when she opened her shawl up, there was every water power that exists, cyclones, tornadoes, you know, everything, water spouts, everything, that were just moving and dangling and thunder and lightning and everything. And I, and I cried as I walked because I witnessed something that I wasn't looking to witness, but she showed me how powerful that is. And, um, and I share it. I don't share it very often, but I share it with you just to give you the idea of, um, of that, that source, that source of power for the water. It's incredible. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay, so now we're gonna, um, I, I always say, what can we do? And um, I'm going to sing the water song and I'm gonna teach you about it. Um, if you go on to YouTube, you can learn it at your leisure, but I'm gonna teach you today. Um, the water song, you know, we have a, um, we have, to pay tribute to a great uh, Japanese physicist by the name of Dr. Yamato, who is now in the spirit world. And um, he started in the early 80s to take his message around the world that we should pray for the water. And he did a study to prove why we should pray for the water. And in this study, um, there's a book called Hidden Messages in the Water. And it, it basically, um, depicts his study of water and its, and its relativity to us and its response to when we treat it bad and when we treat it good. So the water that we're treating bad um, in a microscopic ice picture doesn't look, it doesn't look like a snowflake. It looks like it's, it's corrupted, it's black, it's, it's missing half of its body. It's not a full snowflake. But then when he took pictures of the water that we um, that was blessed and was sang to and loved, then that, that picture of that ice crystal was complete and beautiful and very intricate and uh, like a complete beautiful snowflake, then sometimes we see that. So his message was water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. So in our language, in Shnabe Moen, it's nebe, gizage igu, gimi gwechewe nimigu, gijewe nimigu. And so that's what we are saying when we pass the rivers and lakes. We say, Nibe gizage igu, gimi gwechewe nimigu, gijewe nimigu. So my grandson, Omashkuns, he was eight then, and he's in college now. He's in Casco University. He's 18 now. He said, Awalita, why don't you just sing that? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> because I never thought about singing it. We always said that in a language, and we didn't take it any further than that. And so um, that day that he said to me, just sing that, then I did sing, I, I did sing it, and I don't know, the, the spirit mem, uh, melody came, and it hasn't changed to this day. So I'm going to sing it, but I don't want to sing it by myself. So I want you to help. And this is when I say, what can we do? You can sing, okay? <coughs> <coughs> Show 
so we're going to think about the Mississippi, which is right over here. Nibe Gisa Geigo Gimi Gwecho Enemigo Gisha Enemigo Okay, I want to hear more of you guys. I think this side's getting louder, but this side over here, I don't know where you guys are at. So I'm going to step back a little bit so I can actually hear you, because all I can hear is myself up here. So OK, let's go. Okay, you guys got a little bit louder, but let's just, can we just close our eyes? No one's going to look at you. And we're just going to sing it really good, okay? So one, one last time, let's give her. Nibe Gisa Geiko Gimi Gwensho Enemigo Gisha Yourselves a hand. Me <laughs> glad you've been a good audience. <laughs>